Hello, uh, my name is uh, Professor Barry Thompson and I'm from the University of Southern California. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at the Rizzo campus in Denmark today and have a chance to talk to you about um, our research in the area of polymer fullerene solar cells. Uh, hopefully today I'll be able to tell you a little bit about our uh, strategy for developing new polymers and, and how we use those to optimize uh, solar cell devices. Um, just to, to refresh uh, your memory, if you're not as uh, familiar with the operation of these devices, I'll be talking today about uh, polymer fullerene cells. And so these are solution processed bulk heterojunction structures in which the polymer and fullerene, uh, like the P3HT and, and fullerene shown here, are typically blended together in solution and then cast to form an active layer uh, between two different electrodes. Um, the morphology of these types of de devices is critically important um, as it's very important to generate a bicontinuous type of structure uh, where these two materials then have a large surface area with one another, as we can see in the lower part of the slide. Um, I won't be talking too much about the morphology today, uh, but that will be implicit in any of the devices uh, that are being discussed. Um, on the right side, uh, I show a very general mechanism for these types of solar cells in which light is uh, primarily thought to be absorbed uh, by the polymer, generating an excited species or an exciton, uh, which then diffuses as a critical step in the operation of the device uh, until it reaches the interface uh, with an acceptor uh, where there's then a strong driving force for charge transfer. And after that, then uh, separated charges can move within the device. If we think for a moment about the state of the art in this field, um, here's a few examples of some of the best uh, performing polymers that have been reported in the literature. And we can see that efficiencies in the range of 9 to, to in excess of 10% are reasonably common uh, at this point in time. Uh, one thing I will note about these uh, structures is that there is a general similarity between them in that they all are of the perfectly alternating donor acceptor type. And as I've highlighted here in red, uh, we have the acceptor type monomer and in blue we have the donor type monomer. And it's really ubiquitous uh, in the current literature to use this type of perfectly alternating approach to generate high performing polymers. Now, while this has been very successful in leading to high efficiencies, there are uh, potential uh, drawbacks or at least room for improvement uh, when we look at this type of structure. So, for example, um, one thing we can see with this type of approach is that in order to generate these really highly tailored electronic structures, uh, monomer chemical structures are typically also highly tailored. And as a result, the chemical synthesis is quite long and typically involved. And so, for example, with the well-known polymer uh, PTB7 here, 14-step uh, synthesis uh, is involved. Uh, and some polymers even more lengthy. Now, it became apparent to us that perhaps this very long and focused monomer synthesis uh, was not really consistent uh, with the idea of a low-cost uh, solar technology. Further drawbacks of this perfectly alternating polymer or monomer approach, as we call it, um, are that the polymers typically have relatively narrow absorption spectra. As we can see here in the lower left corner uh, for PTB7, uh, the polymer itself absorbs rather narrowly across the visible and into the edge of the near infrared. And a number of other drawbacks that I've listed here uh, can be pinpointed as well. As a consequence, in my group, we've tried to look at a different strategy for generating polymers, and we call this the polymer approach, in which, as a central tenet, we try to avoid uh, lengthy and complex uh, monomer synthesis. Uh, we try to use these simple monomers, then, in strategic combinations and patterns, as opposed to simply relying on a perfectly alternating structure at all times. Uh, we also try to keep the device structure simple, um, as I'll be highlighting uh, in the talk uh, today as well. And so we have three main projects um, that I'll be highlighting today. Um, our direct aeration polymerization, our work on random polymers, and our work on ternary blends. So, for example, our work in semi-random polymers uh, has been centered around the concept of using strategic combinations of simple monomers. And this allows us to have very short and accessible uh, syntheses uh, that give polymers with excellent properties. 
Additionally, we've focused on uh, using ternary blend uh, solar cells, uh, which allows us to use combinations of these simple polymers in order to target higher efficiency devices. And this will be the primary focus of my uh, lecture today. Finally, uh, we're also trying to simplify the synthesis of the polymers uh, by using direct aerylation polymerization, CH activation method, uh, in order to replace uh, the stilly polycondensation and the use of tin, uh, which has really become um, uh, ubiquitous in, in this field in making polymers. And so efforts in our group have been aimed at trying to remove uh, the use of the tin functional group and simply activate uh, carbon-hydrogen bonds. So first I want to talk just very briefly about our work on random polymers because uh, we'll be using these throughout the rest of the talk. Our strategy here was based on the idea that P3HT is a very attractive uh, polymer in that it's semi-crystalline, it has a high charge carrier mobility, it blends well with fullerenes, but the band gap is just a little bit too high. And as a result, um, it's necessary to try to move the absorption edge more towards the red. So we've kept the nice simple synthesis of P3HT, uh, but in this case we've started adding in small amounts of acceptor monomers, uh, like the benzothiodiazole that you see here. And with only 10% of benzodia benzothiodiazole, um, we can then introduce that randomly into the polymer backbone, and conceptually, uh, this is used to then generate multiple different chromophores in the same structure. Uh, and so we can imagine that if the effective conjugation length of our polymer is typical at 10 to 15 rings, that any 10 to 15 ring segment uh, could have any number of different donor acceptor interactions. And so, as a result, many different chromophores. And so we've used this strategy in a number of cases. Uh, typically, as we see here on this slide, we've used monomers with solubilizing groups uh, like the diketo parole um, But we've been able to use this to generate families of polymers where the electronic structure is fine-tuned um, across um, ranges to give precise properties. And so, for example, with this uh, polymer that contains 10% uh, of the DPP unit, uh, we can see that the efficiency has increased relative to P3HT, uh, primarily as a result of increases in the short circuit current. And the external quantum efficiency shows that indeed uh, that is due to a broadening of the photon capture uh, spectrum. Uh, the other important fact here is that the fill factor of these polymers is essentially equivalent uh, to that of a P3HT uh, PCM, PCBM device. And so the polymers are working very effectively in these blends. Another nice thing about the random polymers is that by changing the amounts of the different components, as I mentioned, we can finely tune properties. Uh, for example, by adding electron rich or electron withdrawing side chains, we can fine tune the HOMO and LUMO energies. Um, additionally, we can add fluorinated or other side chains that are hydrophilic in order to fine tune surface properties and or uh, blending capacity with the polymers. And so this has been a very successful class of polymers and I refer you back to the earlier slide in my talk which gives a number of references uh, for our work on this. Now one thing I'd like to focus on for a moment about our synthesis is our focus on direct aerylation polymerization. And so the idea here is, as I mentioned before, to replace uh, the tin group uh, with a direct CH activation step. And so to shorten the synthetic chemistry um, and remove the cryogenic step and the use of tin. The real challenge with this kind of chemistry is that often on monomers, there are a number of different uh, CH groups that could potentially be activated in the reaction. And as a consequence, unselective uh, aerolations can occur, which could potentially lead to branching or even cross-linking at the extreme. As a result, much of our work has focused on trying to understand these defect-forming reactions and prevent them. Uh, one condition uh, that is worth noting in this uh, field of direct aerolation is the chemistry uh, that has been begun by Ozawa and really explored a lot by Mario Leclerc, uh, but chemistry that involves the use of a palladium-2 catalyst, um, a rather air-sensitive phosphine ligand, um, and superheated THF. A rather difficult reaction condition, but one that gives, as we see here, uh, polymers with excellent uh, properties. 
Our group, on the other hand, has been much more focused on conditions uh, that were started by Keith Fanu, uh, which it relies on bench stable reagents and uses reactions that can be done under ambient pressure. And so, for example, here, uh, conditions we've developed uh, from the small molecule chemistry done by Keith Fanu uh, allow us to synthesize uh, P3HT using palladium acetate, uh, potassium carbonate, a carboxylic acid additive, and do this well below the boiling point of the solvent. A problem we found, though, is that with these conditions, uh, despite their success with small molecules, that unselective side reactions like branching do occur in the polymers. And so our strategy has been to rely on our understanding of the mechanism and the fact that a concerted uh, methylation deprotonation step, as is shown here, uh, is, is used in the uh, proton abstraction step that goes through a six-membered transition state involving the carboxylic acid. So in order to prevent reactions on the side chain, uh, we have moved from pavalic acid, or small carboxylic acids, to the use of very large, bulky carboxylic acids like neodecanoic acid, which is an inexpensive, commercially available acid source. With this very bulky acid, reaction on the polymer side chain is now inhibited. And as a result, when we compare at the top here, a polymer made with pavalic acid, where we see a substantial amount of beta defect in the NMR, or branching, we now see with neodecanoic acid that branching is removed. And we find as a result that the polymers work equivalently to P3HT synthesized uh, by Stille in solar cells. Now one other area in this type of direct aerylation chemistry that we're looking at is so-called oxidative uh, direct aerylation. Uh, this doesn't refer to oxidation of the monomer, but rather reoxidation of the catalyst. And so in this case, the focus is to simplify the reaction even one step further uh, by using a monomer that has two hydrogens and even no halogen at this point. Our initial results in this area show that while the chemistry doesn't necessarily work well for alkyl thiophenes, it works very well for thiophenes substituted with polar or electron withdrawing groups like esters uh, that I show here at the bottom. And as we see in the data table, um, when we use the 3 hexyl ester thiophene, uh, we're able to achieve molecular weights of about 15,000 and surprisingly high regioregularities of about 85%. Uh, uh, currently, we're trying, uh, pardon me, we're currently we're trying to better understand um, the oxidant and its role because we've used silver carbonate in excess, uh, but ultimately using oxygen as the oxidant here uh, would be much more attractive. Now, in addition to generating new polymer architectures and looking at new chemistries, we are also focused on thinking about ways to make uh, devices more efficient. And while many people have turned to the tandem cell, which I illustrate here, um, we feel that this approach offers a number of drawbacks for large-scale production, especially when you're talking about solution processing. And so as an alternative, uh, we've focused on the so-called ternary blend, where now, like a tandem cell, we have two complementary absorbers uh, blended in a single layer. Um, but as opposed to the tandem cell, um, these are not requiring sequential processing steps. Now, originally, uh, when the ternary blends uh, were first uh, discussed in the literature about five or six years ago, um, it was thought that, yes, certainly having multiple absorbers could increase the short circuit current, but it was felt that there would be a problem with the open circuit voltage. And this uh, Homo Lumo diagram that I, I show here at the bottom of the slide illustrates conceptually why um, this was thought. So for example, if we have a, a wide gap donor and a narrow gap donor uh, with a common acceptor, uh, it was felt that whether you generated charge by exciting the, the wide gap donor or the narrow gap donor, ultimately all the holes in this device would end up in the higher line HOMO and as a consequence limit the open circuit voltage or pin the open circuit voltage to the more minimal value and then this would ultimately limit the value of this type of device. We did a model study a few years back which proved that this wasn't necessarily the case and so for example we looked at ternary blends based on P3HT with varying ratios of two different fullerenes, uh, 
PCBM and ICBA. And what we saw was that as the ratio of the two fullerenes with their two different LUMOs, as we changed that ratio, the open circuit voltage of the device also changed in proportion to that composition. And furthermore, uh, this change in voltage occurred at essentially constant fill factor, which tells us uh, that we're not generating any additional traps, despite the fact that we now have a much more electronically heterogeneous structure. So it tells us that if we have the right system, we can not only ultimately broaden the absorption, but we could also have a non-limiting open circuit voltage. As a result, uh, the focus has really now become trying to understand how these devices work and then try to design uh, more optimal uh, materials. A few models have been proposed in the literature. Uh, I show a couple here uh, that are referred to as the charge or energy transfer model. Um, both of these essentially assume a cascade type of mechanism for either energy or charge transfer. Neither mechanism, however, is able to explain the open circuit voltage. Uh, one mechanism that was proposed a few years ago uh, by Wei Yu uh, was this so-called parallel-like model, uh, which suggests two polymers that form completely independent phases, but will form a common interface with a single fullerene acceptor. Um, this model does offer some explanations about the open circuit voltage, uh, but if you look at this paper cited here by Kemmerink uh, recently, uh, there are a number of uh, drawbacks uh, to this model which seem to make it less likely as an explanation at the current time. In my group, and in collaboration with uh, Robert Street at uh, Palo Alto Research Center, uh, we developed the so-called alloy model to understand how these devices are working. And the rest of my talk will be about our understanding of this. I did want to point out, though, that a recent uh, theoretical work by uh, Mark Ratner and Tobin Marks at Northwestern uh, suggests that if the optimal ternary pair of materials is used, that there's a potential for a 40% increase in performance relative to a binary polymer fullerene blend. This is very similar to what you would see with uh, a tandem cell as well. So let's think for a moment about this alloy model. Um, here, uh, looking back at the uh, polymer and two fullerene system and looking at a plot of the voltage versus composition. And if we look at the endpoint at 100% ICBA uh, composition, we can see that there's a very high voltage. But if we replace 10% of the ICBA with PCBM, we can see that the voltage drops. Replaced with 10 more percent, the voltage drops again. And this led us to hypothesize that effectively, we have a system that has a, comp a constant donor with a constant homo energy, but that effectively we have an acceptor where the LUMO energy is now dependent on the composition of the two fullerene components. And from our interaction with uh, Robert Street, um, this led to the alloy model by comparison with inorganic alloys. And that's where the term comes from, through the analogy. Essentially what uh, was pointed out is that when we think about inorganic alloys, like indium gallium nitride, uh, the band gap changes with the composition of the structure. But it changes because the valence band edge and the conduction band edge are composition dependent, just like we see above, hypothetically, with our two fullerene system. So we've done a lot of work to try to establish this model using both electronic and physical methods. Uh, some of the first experiments we did were electronic. Uh, for example, trying to extend this hypothesis that we have a composition-dependent LUMO energy in the fullerene blends, we felt that this should also affect the charge transfer state energy of these blends. Uh, because the charge transfer state is um, a bound species of a hole in the donor HOMO and an electron in the acceptor LUMO. So working with Robert Street, um, we did photocurrent spectral response measurements, essentially a very, very sensitive EQE measurement. And we were able to see that as the composition of the fullerenes changed, the energy of this CT state changed proportionally, just like we see with the voltage and 
as a result of what we expect to be a changing LUMO energy. Now we've also moved on from the two fullerene system as a model and started looking uh, much more at two polymer systems because they offer the added benefit of being able to more precisely tailor a broadened absorption, a synergistic absorption between the two. So here's a pair of two polymers we've looked at uh, in great detail. Um, here, of course, the hypothesis is that the homo energy of the donor pair is composition dependent in these structures. Now, if we move on to the next slide, we can see a very recent measurement uh, done in collaboration with Lin Lu at Princeton University, uh, where now we've directly been able to measure the homo energy of these blends uh, using photoelectron spectroscopy. And what we can see is that as the two polymers are blended in different ratios, that each specific ratio has a unique ionization potential. And that ionization potential, as you see here, tracks essentially linearly with composition. Uh, and this is really probably the most direct evidence we have so far that this hypothetical averaging of the homo energy and the alloy uh, is occurring in these types of structures. Now here, just briefly to show the data, I mean, these, these polymer pairs work very well in the ternary blends. Uh, we can see that as the ratio of the polymers is changed, that the open circuit voltage changes in composition uh, with that, but also that the fill factor um, remains essentially constant, which once again is very important in telling us that we're not generating trap states uh, in these devices. So the question then became, okay, we have this understanding of the electronic properties, uh, but what is occurring with the physical structure? How can we have this averaging? So our feeling was that the two polymers must be mixing together in order to have this type of intimate interaction uh, in an electronic sense. While, of course, it's difficult to mix two polymers together, there are several factors uh, which can help polymers to mix. Uh, for example, the random copolymer effect, uh, whereas if we have two polymers, with a common co-monomer that's randomly distributed, it helps to make the mix. And we certainly have that here with two hexylthiophene-rich structures. Having a similar surface energy also is indicative of the likelihood of miscibility. And finally, co-crystallization is another thing we can look at very directly uh, that tells us about miscibility. Now, it turns out uh, from a collaborative project with Lin Lu that these two polymers specifically do actually co-crystallize. And we were able to observe this on data collected at, at the Cornell uh, synchrotron. And so let me just look at the, the 100 peak here for the two polymers. Uh, starting at the top with the pure ethyl hexyl copolymer and moving to the bottom as we add progressively more of the DPP copolymer. Uh, what we see, if you focus on the dashed line, is that the peak shifts monotonically as we change the composition. Furthermore, the full width half max changes very little in these uh, patterns. This is pretty strong evidence that the two polymers are actually co-crystallizing with each other and offers a really good explanation for why we see uh, this intimate electronic interaction. Now coming at this from the other side, uh, we also wanted to look at a pair of polymers that we felt would be unlikely to mix together, in other words, unlikely to form an alloy, and see how they would behave. And so here's an example where we've kept PCBM as the acceptor, and we've retained our random DPP polymer as the long wavelength absorber, but now we've used the perfectly alternating PCD-TBT as the mid-gap absorbing uh, material. So we see here that the surface energies of the two polymers are quite different. We also have a random polymer versus a perfectly alternating polymer, excluding the random copolymer effect. And we also have one semi-crystalline polymer and one amorphous polymer, which should make co-crystallization very unlikely. What we see here is something that's dramatically different. So for example, if we look at the data in the table highlighted in green, uh, this is the data for the low gap polymer, the DPP material, and the fullerene. It gives a voltage of about 0.58. And in red at the bottom, we see the PCD-TBT data, which gives a voltage of more than 0.9. What we see, if we look at the graph on the right, 
is that even at 95% composition of the red polymer, that the voltage is pinned to the value determined by the green polymer. This is clearly a pinning effect and something that's in sharp contrast to what we saw uh, with the alloy. Uh, furthermore, as I highlight here, we see that the fill factor is quite low in some of these blends. And we've been able to show in other work that this is due to a trapping effect in terms of both holes and excitons from our uh, DPP uh, polymer. So it does indeed seem necessary to have polymer pairs that are miscible with one another in order to form this alloy, which leads to the synergistic properties in the ternary blend. And so in recent work, we've been working on making designed pairs of polymers that should mix together. And in a paper that came out last year, we showed that we could very precisely tune the surface energy of polythiophenes uh, by varying the ratio of hydrophobic to alkyl side chains or hydrophilic to alkyl side chains, as we show here. And in the upper right plot, uh, we can see that we can tune the surface energy very precisely with composition. Now importantly, we've also isolated the hydrophilic and hydrophobic groups from the backbone through an alkyl spacer so as to keep the electronic properties essentially constant. And we can see here on the following slide in the table that all of these polymers, regardless of composition, have homo energies that are within error the same, um, band gaps that are the same. Uh, we can see the absorption profiles are essentially the same. Um, the only place where there's a real difference is in the packing in the crystal structure of the polymers. And so, for example, with the semifluorofunctional polymer uh, that we see here in the middle at the bottom, um, the 100 peak uh, shifts pretty remarkably based on the structure. And so that's one thing we continue to look at in terms of trying to design materials to mix together. It's also controlling that aspect. All right, so uh, hopefully today I've been able to give you a, a bit of an overlook about our approach to generating polymers and polymer fullerene solar cells. Um, the alloy model that I spoke about second has, has been pretty successful in explaining how these ternary blends work and has allowed us to now have a design principle to move forward. Uh, with newer systems. Uh, and of course that's based on our understanding of and the value of random polymers which give us the ability to fine-tune structural properties uh, through the use of combinations of very simple monomers uh, which is also ultimately very attractive. And so um, I'd like to finish up then and give thanks to a few people. Uh, first of all the NSF uh, through the CBET program for funding our work on ternary blends. Uh, collaborators uh, Robert Street and Lin Liu. Um, also, of course, uh, Frederick Krebs and Eva Bundgaard here at, uh, at Rizzo, uh, and as well as the students uh, that I've listed here who've contributed strongly to this work. Uh, thank you very much.